Please take your Bibles tonight to Psalm 42. Psalm 42. The message tonight is trusting when troubled. It's my life psalm. It became so on the island of Samar. And I struggled if I should bring this message tonight, but I already know it's what the Lord would have after some of the comments of your pastor. There are troubles that you and I go through. We like to encourage people to be missionaries. We want to encourage people to live for the Lord. But there's a reality also of hardships that you and I know must be faced. And I must speak from this psalm tonight for myself. Otherwise, I could not represent uh, the work of Samar in the part that I had. For the first year, I too wanted to quit. But I had no money to even make a phone call. The money wasn't coming through. We were stranded on the island. I begged the Lord to give me an exotic disease <laughs> so I could come home with honor. I did. Ah, oh, he came home in one year. Well, it's not his fault. He was sick. Psalm 42, to the chief musician, Maskil, for the sons of Korah. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come tonight, Lord, with humbled hearts of our need of the ministry of your Holy Spirit to understand the things of God. Grant it to us. We do thank you, Lord, for this church. We thank you for Pastor Paul and the, and the staff that labors with him and for your people, many who have been faithful for so many years and for how that you have used this work. Thank you for Pastor Auckland tonight out there in Watertown and, and for Carol. And how that you've used them, Lord, again in a marvelous way out there. We thank you, Lord, for uh, calling the Hoppies to the Philippines. Thank you for Rob and Beth Ann. We thank you tonight for Don and Jean. And, uh, Lord, I know that you're going to bless their willingness to leave mother and father, brothers and sisters, houses and lands for your namesake and receive, receive a hundredfold in this life and in the life to come. Meet their every need. 
Grant them God's speed to raise the money quickly and to labor for you there in the land of Ireland. But Lord, help us also tonight to, to see from the scriptures a part of life that we're also all very familiar with. And that is the afflictions of the righteous are many. And help us to also see that the Lord delivereth them out of them all. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone said the Christian life is not a bed of roses. But you know it really is. Roses have big thorns. As well as beautiful flowers. Uh, Hermine and I, we were driving home yesterday and just up the road here, up by the corner, this rose bush all blossomed out with roses on it November 15th. We were amazed how beautiful a rose is, but I wouldn't want to lay in a bed of roses, would you? The Christian life is like a bed of roses. It has its fragrance to it, its beauty that cannot be compared but the afflictions of the righteous are many. To some of you tonight, the thoughts that we'll see in the psalmist, from the psalmist are all very real to you. To some of you, maybe not yet, but will be. In that some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. And God intends to teach us something through our troubles and that is to trust him As a matter of fact our troubles are permitted and even designed of God to bring him glory as as well as our benefit our welfare and to teach us but all of it falls apart if we fall into unbelief it's easy to see the truth and to speak well of things when we're under the sunshine. But we're, when we're under thick, dark clouds and the waves are beating into the boat and the boat is about to sink, it's so easy to say to the Lord, don't you care, we perish, and to forget about the one who's in that sinking boat with us. The psalmist was speaking to himself. Maybe that's good sometimes for us to do. He was having a great conflict of going from great depression to a statement of encouragement to himself. Look at his trouble. It's outward. In verse 4, he says, When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept holy day. Something was keeping him from the house of God. To a Jew, the temple was everything. It was their life. It was their nation. And he had had that taken away from him. He was being reproached in verse 10, as with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me, while they say, where is thy God? And as they asked him that question, he was asking the same himself. For if our enemies are able to mock us in that God seems to have abandoned us, then it really must look that way. But worse was the inward trouble, for he did feel cut off. He was going through a storm of doubt in that the Lord has forgotten him. He says in verse 9, I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? He was feeling this. He was going through this. He was at the bottom. There was no place to look anymore. Even looking up was no relief. 
He says in verse 3, My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? In verse 5, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? His soul was cast down. He was in a depression. A heavy weight was upon him, and nothing could change it. Verse 6, O oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. He's amazed. In verse 1, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? The heart is the deer. It's a type of deer, a flighty, fearful animal, known to have its secret streams when it flees in fear. And need of, a great need of water at that time, the adrenaline is going, and, and they have their secret place, their hiding place, and there the stream always is. Fear comes up and the deer runs, worse of all, back to its secret place, and you can't imagine the stream is dry. And the psalmist says, I'm like that deer. And the word pant is also the word to, to cry. Not just panting, but crying after it because it's always been there and it's not there now. The Lord's always been there, but He's not there now. And our understanding is not fruitful, and the, the, uh, the battle is hot-pitched, and the burdens are high, and the mountains are high. And we know what the Bible says, and we make our prayer, but nothing changes. All seems to be potentially lost. Worst-case scenario, and we're victims to a fixed fate. And his soul is cast down. Have you ever been there? He asked several questions. He asked why many times. He asked when in verse 2, when am I going to come to be with the Lord? He asked where. He didn't understand what was happening to him. And it'd be tempting for you and I to jump to the wrong conclusions at a time like this and to give up and to quit. Our first year in the mission field, there was a little small congregation of people in Kapolog Logan Samar. I spent three months with them and it began to blossom and bud. But there was sin in the camp that I could not work with. And I wasn't about to be satisfied to have taken my wife and children to the other side of the world and waste my time with people that would refuse to repent, people in leadership. And so I talked and I prayed and I just had to separate and, and realize that this was impossible. God could never work in the situation that was there. And I had to separate from that small group of believers and just let them alone and didn't want to hurt them or bother them, but I, I just had to leave. I had a little radio broadcast that I spoke English on. And the one man got very angry with me. Tried to get my visa revoked. He uh, one day tried to get me killed by uh, coordinating with, with another enemy. Hard to believe. Canceled my radio broadcast behind my back. And we find ourselves, after being there three months with no friends, no money, no health. Everything had fallen apart. One day, my son Micah was eating a little skin, a, a, a fruit, and a piece of the skin got stuck in his throat. Couldn't get it out. 
and your mind wants to go crazy as he's turning blue. I laid him down on the couch and could not get him out. He was, he was going. And that's when you just pray for God's mercy and grace. The Lord just impressed me, just let him alone. Let him pass out. And when he did, his throat relaxed and it came out. But I didn't need that kind of trial at that time. Our daughter Rachel misses a step, falls down, gets a concussion. I didn't need that on top of it all. Our boy Samuel was dying. They didn't know why. Our doctor lived across the street, trained in Manila. I didn't need that burden at the time either. Oh, I must have some kind of terrible sin in my life. Something must be going on bad here. We just couldn't figure out what was wrong with him, but he was going down and down and down. One time I couldn't find her meaning. She was in one of the rooms upstairs, burning up with fever from amoeba. Didn't want me to see it. The one man who was, became, had become my enemy would come to my... I built a little prayer house in the back of our home. This is where we still lived down in Borok on the edge of a town there. And I had a little grass house I had in the back. And... I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. All I could do was, was lay on my face and wonder where, where the Lord is, what is going on. And he'd come out to visit me. And he'd come out all clickety-clack and happy and snapping heels and he'd sit down and there I am with a broken heart and amazement, only loving his people, wanting to see his people saved. All he wanted to do was get me out. And he said, we had a great day yesterday. We don't need you in this place. If God wanted you here, why doesn't he help you? I wouldn't say a word to him. Wouldn't say a word. And he'd leave. From December 1981 until May of 1982, that was our life. We didn't get any money January, February, March. There was a mix-up in telegraphic transfer. I couldn't even get off the island to make a phone call. I had no money. My soul was cast down. I learned something. You never waste time praying. I didn't have to make myself pray. It was an effort to stop praying. Didn't have to make an effort to fast. It was a distraction to eat time of difficulty and burden and all I could do was read the scriptures and spend my days out in that prayer house and and just uh, call upon the Lord hour after hour and week after week and not knowing what's going on and and had the Lord forsaken us and to say I will say unto my God why hast thou forgotten me And almost every missionary I know of has gone through a similar experience. And almost every pastor I know of goes through the same thing. Where the burdens get so heavy, you don't know what to think. You don't know what to do. But after going with Pastor Paul out to the field last October... And seeing what I saw, being with these men and again and seeing what God has done, I've learned something. It's worth keeping on even if you think you're failing. I believed I was failing in every way and I, I was failing. We don't have much to offer the Lord and we have an enemy that cannot be seen who hates our soul and hates the cause of Christ and would do to us what he did to Job if he just had the permission. But no matter how dark the night gets, it's worth to keep trusting the Lord for he's able to take of the slightest effort and the most miserable works that we might do and bless them down the road and cause them to bring forth fruit a hundredfold. Even my motives to go to Samar, I know were not pure in the sight of God. 
I didn't originally go there just to see people saved. I wanted a chance to defeat communism on my own terms. I didn't like losing it one time. I wanted to win it. And so those motives weren't pure. But God blessed in spite of it. Notice the psalmist's trust. He wanted nothing less than the presence of God. He says in our passage, verse 1, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. Nothing else would matter. There was no program. There was no, no verse. There wasn't even a prayer that seemed to make much sense anymore. There was no horizon of hope. Only God himself was all that would satisfy the soul. And his trust became limited to what the Lord could do. Not within ourselves. He knew his trial came from the Lord. Verse 7. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. He knew his help comes from the Lord. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night his song shall be with me. And my prayer unto the God of my life. He told, tells himself to trust. In verse 5, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet be helped for the help of his countenance. Verse 11, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who's the health of my countenance and my God. We need to trust in our troubles. We might not trust perfectly. We may trip and stumble and not handle things very well sometimes. But he's greater than our troubles and greater than our hearts. And he sees the end from the beginning and he is greater than a 24-hour day. And he's able to do the impossible. It really is worth trusting the Lord and not to give up on him. No matter what he brings our way, Learning that lesson was something I needed to learn. There were going to be other trials that would come. But when the Lord decided the, the time of trial was over, all I could do was hang on. I decided, well, let's just start a church. I rented a house down the street, got two men to make benches, I had no idea what I was doing. I had a Warai Bible and I had an English Bible. I found out the same verse. I had no idea what it said though. I didn't even know how to pronounce it. And we got people from around us to come to that church and there were a couple Christians who, who were in that town who joined us and, and I opened my Bible to 1 John 1, 5 uh, that uh, uh, God is light and over here I'd say I'm Jos Kalamragan. Of course I probably said it funny. Then I'd say it again and say it again and say it this way and emphasize that word and woman got saved. The next week I was going by uh, the Powell office where I, I used to get a newspaper and uh, Brother Burt was standing there right near the tennis court and he was troubled. He says, what's your plan? Well, you have a Bible school. Well, that wasn't my plan. I just barely started the church. I had no idea what I was doing. I said, well, if I have students, the next day I had three, then I had four, and I had five. And I saw that those months of trial and anguish and failure were being turned by the Lord, and all I could do was hold on. He started the church in Kasapa, not me although I get the credit for it. He led his dad to the Lord. He trained his dad to be pastor. Every time I went out there, he was the interpreter. 
And uh, the Lord just began to do things. And, and I believe those months of fasting and prayer were necessary for God to clean me up and to bust me up, to purify my motives and to realize how much of a nothing we really are. There's a loneliness on the mission field that I need to mention tonight. This is not a complaint. Matter of fact, my family and I, when we talk about the Philippines, we almost are not even honest because all we think about, think about is what wonderful times we had. How wonderful it was there. That's all we ever talk about. But I know there was another side. Extreme loneliness. That's why teams are good. People be together. But there's a loneliness in the ministry that I don't know how to describe. Your pastor has it. He carries the care of this church that nobody else, not even Leslie, can share with him. And there are burdens upon these men that you send out that they cannot put in the prayer list, prayer letter, without looking like a complainer. There are burdens of heart and there is loneliness on the mission field that, that just about consumes people. One day, one week, I watched my little girl, Rachel, struggle under, under dengue fever, 105 degrees for five, six, seven days. I watched her dying before my eyes. There's nothing to do. It's got to run, it cor run its course. We put her in our bedroom and we had her hooked up with IV to try to stem off the, the dehydration. I anointed her with oil till I almost used the bottle up. She remembers it to this day. She says, Dad, are you supposed to do it every day? <laughs> she remembers I did it about every half hour. I almost wanted to pray to Buddha, but I knew it wasn't right. <laughs> Lord, help me. Lord, help her. Mercy. Grace. You just keep crying out. You just keep praying out. And against all odds, you just keep trusting. And as a result of that, the way that, whatever way it turns out, you're, you're ready to accept it. The death of children on Samar was a burden to me. So many children die. I used to enjoy going into the, the little grass house where a child was dead. And dad's outside mad and drunk. Mother's in the house either staring at the baby or going hysterical. I used to enjoy closing the eyes, keeping them closed until they stayed closed. Keep the flies out of the mouth. Cover it. Buy the wood to, to build the casket. And, but it begins to have an effect on you. Before you know it, your soul is cast down again. Everything just dying around you all the time. And you begin to get affected with your mind. And you begin to lose your joy. And, and not, you can't think right. And you have to just cry out and, and just trust the Lord again. And then He brings you through it. There's a stream for you and I that's a safe place. That's the Lord. But sometimes we run to that stream, it might appear dry. And we have to cry out. But he'll hear that cry. We need to endure and, and hold on and keep going through and pray it through. And in time, the Lord turns our reverses into stepping stones. Heavenly Father, we thank you this night, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. And Father, I know tonight that there barely be one Christian here who has not tasted the bitter pill, Lord, of feeling forsaken or forgotten. It seems to be, Lord, our portion. 
Help us to see tonight that we can trust you through it. Help us the next valley that we go through to not forget that truth. To not despair. And to say to our soul and to ask it why it's cast down. For you shall yet help us with your very presence.